The age that went before the Great Aurora event is lost to history, apparently obliterated by plasma bombarding the Earth from other solar system bodies. The Grand Canyons on Earth and Mars, possibly bearing scars from this prehistoric event, that would separate this wave of existence from the Golden Epic, when life was long and the Earth was plentiful to all people. When the light of the sky shone down on the people as a godlike figure worshipped by the earthlings who would come to fear great events as the figures in the sky waged war against other sky gods, this was the manifestation of the greatest event in human memory. David Talbot explains in the Saturn myth that if our generation dismisses the possibility of fact in the language of myth, then it is because we are aware of major discrepancies between myth and the modern world view. And we therefore ascribe it to the blindness or superstition of the ancients, an ignorant assumption from an apparently intelligent people. There is hardly an ancient tale which fails to speak of world destroying upheavals and shifting cosmic orders. Indeed, we are so accustomed to the catastrophic character of these stories that we hardly give it a second thought. When the myths tell us of suns which have come and gone, or of planetary gods whose wars threaten to destroy mankind, we are likely to take them as absurdly exaggerated accounts of localized events or write them off altogether as expressions of unconstrained fancy. How many scholars seeking to unravel the astronomical legends and symbols of antiquity have questioned whether the heavenly bodies have always coursed on the same paths they follow today. William Whiston published in 1696 a new theory of the earth, arguing that the biblical deluge resulted from a comet impact. The book produced a storm of scientific objections and had no lasting impact outside Christian Orthodox belief. However, in 1882 and 1883, two books by author Ignatius Donnelly appeared, Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, and Ragnar Ruk, The Age of Fire and Gravel. Relying on global myths, the author claimed that a massive continent called Atlantis once harbored a fantastic civilization, but the entire land sank beneath the sea when a comet rained destruction on the Earth. Both of these publications became bestsellers and are still available today, yet conventional theories of Earth and the solar system remain unaffected by these works. Around the turn of the century, Isaac Vale argued in a series of brief papers that myths of cosmic upheaval relate to the collapse of ice bands surrounding our planet. Three quarters of a century after his death, his work is familiar only to the esoteric few. In 1913, Hans Holbege published his Glacial Cosmogony, contending that the great catastrophes described in ancient myths occurred when the Earth captured another planet, which became known as Earth's moon. The relatively small interest in this thesis vanished within a couple of decades, but this was the extent of noteworthy research into myth and catastrophe. When Emanuel Velikovsky in early 1940 first wondered whether a cosmic disturbance may have accompanied the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Wait till you hear this. According to the biblical account, massive plagues occurred, Mount Sinai erupted, and the pillar of cloud and fire moved in the sky. His quest for a solution led Velikovsky through a systematic survey of world mythology and eventually to the conclusion that ancient myths constitute a collective memory of celestial disorder. The great gods, as suspiciously observed by Velikovsky, appear explicitly as planets. In the Titanic Wars vividly depicted by ancient chronologers, the planets moved on erratic courses appearing to wage battle in the sky, exchanging electrical discharges, and more than once menacing the Earth. Vilikovsky sets forth his claim of celestial catastrophe in his book Worlds in Collision. 
proposing that first Venus and then Mars in the period between 1500 and 686 BC so disturbed the Earth's axis as to produce worldwide destruction. The book became the focus of one of the greatest scientific controversies of the 20th century. Vilikovsky first directs our attention toward Saturn, proposing that the now distant gas planet was once the dominant heavenly body, and he identifies Saturn's epic with the legendary Golden Age. A brief outline of his idea inspired the present inquiry. Was Saturn once the preeminent light in the heavens? While expecting to find, at best, only faint echoes of Saturn, or no hint at all, we instead discover that the ancients, looking back at our so-called beginning to the petroglyph record, where we discover that at the beginning of this wave of existence, that the ancients were obsessed with the planet God and strove in a thousand different ways to relive Saturn's glorious epic. The most common symbols of antiquity, which our age universally regards as solar emblems, were originally unrelated to our sun, despite the force fitting of the sun as the dominant celestial star. We can theorize that these symbols are not relating to the sun. In fact, the descriptions are of the unmoved mover, the celestial light of the heavens, a polar light emanating the radiance of the golden age. The symbols that are universally associated with the sun are in fact literal pictures of the planet Saturn before a supernova event sent out a shockwave of catastrophic proportions. This is the light of whom the entire ancient world invokes as the sun, the celestial sun, the unmoved mover, the planet Saturn. In the original age to which the myth refer, Saturn was no remote speck faintly discerned by terrestrial observers. The planet loomed as an awesome and terrifying light, and if we were to believe the widespread accounts of Saturn's age, the planet God's home was the unmoving celestial pole, the apparent pivot of the heavens, far removed from the visible path of Saturn today. At first glance, David Talbot's theory of the Saturn myths seemed to present an entanglement of bizarre images with the earliest, most venerated religious text, depicting the great god sailing in a celestial ship, consorting with winged goddesses, fashioning revolving islands, cities, and temples, or abiding upon the shoulders of a cosmic giant. It is impossible to pursue Saturn's ancient image without encountering the Paradise of Eden, the Lost Atlantis, the Fountain of Youth, the One-Wheeled Chariot of the Gods, the All-Seeing Eye of Heaven, or the Serpent Dragon of the Deep. Though celebrated as living, visible powers, None of Saturn's personifications or mythical habitats conforms to anything in our familiar world. Yet once one seeks out the concrete nature of these images, it becomes clear that each refer to the same celestial form. The subject is a Saturn configuration of startling simplicity, whose appearance, transformation, and eventual disappearance became the focus of all ancient rites. There now is little doubt that if Velikovsky had pursued the Saturn question to the end, he would have perceived a vastly greater influence of the planet than he originally recognized. He would have discovered also that the full story of Saturn adds a new perspective to much of the mythological material gathered in Worlds in Collision. Nothing comes as a greater surprise to the would-be researcher than the sheer quantity of material bearing directly on the Saturn tradition. The scope of the subject matter will eventually have the most dramatic of consequences in the understanding by our people into our past events that have been completely lost to history. Our understanding is evolving, but the assembly of the gods and what went before the Saturnian Aurora event should be the biggest of questions in the minds of Earthlings today. How were the megalithic structures constructed? What was the technology that was lost? How long did the plasmic events last? And 
What world did the survivors leave behind as they sought shelter in the earth before re-emerging to a world overwhelmingly influenced by what they perceived as the great assembly in the sky? They re-emerged in Egypt and Mesopotamia and began to describe in no uncertain terms what they perceived, a perception that we have classed as mythology. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching. Hey guys, this is the voice of Buzz Weaver and in between the ambient road noise outside, I always enjoy bringing you guys this amazing content for the Lost History Channel. I just wanted to let you guys know that I have a channel on Odyssey as well where you can find all of my material. So if you guys want to swing by and give me a follow, it would be greatly appreciated.